you know, you just focus on the experience that he has in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, we, we pass by it so quickly and nonchalantly and unreflectively. He's sitting, I'm not quite sure what's going through his mind, but he says, let this God pass by me. Okay. If you were to be a little imaginative, this is after, you know, he has his 12 disciples. After the garden, he goes back to his camp, only to be captured by the Romans. Okay. Matthew was a married man. Peter was a married man. John was a married man. Philip was a married man. <clears throat> all the people who followed him, the 12 disciples, they were all, as far as I know, well, not all, but about seven of them were married with children. He's also preaching a gospel that the Pharaoh is your ignorance that lives inside you. That's the Pharaoh. You're no longer being held, you know, in chains, in bondage by someone from the outside. It's your inability to reflect, to examine. He also knows that because he wanted that particular freedom for himself, he left his parents and his village. I'm not sure where he went for 18 years. Okay. He comes back and he has a gospel now. Perhaps deep down as he is sitting and saying to God, let this cup pass by me, he's saying, look, I walk into people's lives, someone like Matthew, someone like Peter. He's a fisherman. He's married with children. There is also Matthew who's also married with kids. They both have jobs. And I'm, for some strange reason, they like me. I like them. I tell them to follow me and they say yes. Who's gonna take care of their wives? Who's gonna take care of their kids? It took me 18 years in the desert to figure out. I was able to overcome the temptation of Satan can Matthew really do that? Can Peter do that? Can people eventually have a glimpse, have an experience of what I myself had? I think he is very much aware of all of those things in that tiny little scene in the gospel of whatever that, you know, I don't think it's paid enough attention to. This is a man who knows what this path is all about and what this path does to people. And in some ways, he's really, really worried for them. You know? I mean, look, consider... It's a bad example, but I use it nevertheless. Consider you really, really just don't like your father. Okay? It has given birth to you packing up your stuff and leaving. You leave because you hate your father. It has given you this emotion of anger which has guided you throughout your life. Sure, it's made you lonely, it's destroyed your relationships, but it is, to some extent, anger becomes your guide. You know, whenever you see anyone having the power to potentially hurt you, you fight back and you leave. That's a great protective mechanism that you have. You come at a crossroad at the age of 30 or 40, you say, I don't want to live like this anymore, I'm tired. You know, I'm tired of being alone, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of that. And then you say, okay, maybe I should kind of figure out who the best therapist in town is. But what is a therapist going to do? A therapist is going to say, you have to fight against 
all the emotions that has have lived inside you for the past 20, 30 years. That's a difficult place to be in life. You have to overcome the anger. Then you have to look at your father. And, you know, overcoming anger in solitary is one thing. But seeing your father and all the things he has or hasn't done for you, that's going to bring another wave of emotions inside you. Now you're being tested and you're going to fail miserably. And now you have two problems. First, you realize that, well, I went to therapy for 20 years. I thought I'm going to see my father and be okay. My hatred for him has doubled upon seeing him. Now you're going to say, am I too incompetent for therapy? All the stuff I learned, was it no good? All the things I thought I have accomplished, that was also an illusion. How could my father do this in like a nanosecond? So you become more angry at yourself and you begin to hate your father even more. And then you're also going to have this very gloomy outlook about therapy, therapists, book, knowledge, all that stuff, you know. You know, there is something that Gurdjieff had spoken of uh, when he was asked, why is it that these esoteric knowledge is not given to everyone? Why is it such a secret? Why does it live underground? And I think his answer was really, really good, which is, it's right there in the open. You know, people really just don't want it. And it's, it's something that, you know, Idris Shah used to say, which was that truth has a tendency of protecting itself, you know. Uh, I think these people, you call them like Jesus and Moses and those people, they are really passed over. We don't really care very much for them. They are nice to talk about when, you know, your belly is full and you don't really know what else to do with your life, so you sit and you have conversations about them. But for the most part, we don't really take them or their ideas very seriously uh, because they're not relevant to our life, you know. If you were to apply the Gospels, if you were to really, really honestly apply the teachings, the lessons of the Gospels to, say, I don't know, the next time you walk into a classroom, uh, your jaw would be terminated. You know, despite our desire to want to be honest, you know, um, because they go against the current of life. I think someone like Jesus for us in twenty second century, in twenty first century. I think what makes him so relevant and so useful and potent is it's something that Viktor Frankl, you know, had said that modern society is slowly moving towards meaninglessness. Mm. You know, whatever had any value has kind of been sucked out of it. You know, almost everything that you touch, it just dies. I mean, that's the function of modern society and modern relationships, you know. And I think the nice thing about Jesus is, as, you know, he comes forth and says, you know, that's the society in which you live. Why don't you just figure out something about yourself that could last a little bit longer? And I think he's a nice person to have in your life, you know, because in some ways he disconnects you from, you know, the, the current tempo of society that moves so fast. 
And the moment you want to hang on to something and have a relationship with it, it's no longer relevant. You know? I don't know what his function was some 2,000 years ago, because people had a good life. You know, people had good etiquettes, they had manners, they had great habits. Kids were raised by an entire village. There weren't really too many divorces. No one had affairs. You know, people shared what little they had with their neighbors. That's not the case today, you know. Uh, and since most of us live in such an isolated environment, inwardly as well as outwardly, I think his ideas could be quite beneficial to the modern psyche that lives in trauma and isolation. In the 1980s, you know, Saeed, um, you've, you've seen him, yeah, met him a few times. Mm-hmm. He had become so um, interested by Sai Baba. Him and I talked and he said, I want to get a ticket and go to India and go to his ashram and pay him a visit and possibly be his student. And during the 80s, you know, there were lots of people going to India and interviewing by Sai Baba and showing his, the, the footage here. That it was becoming fashionable, you know, kind of like uh, Ramana Mahesh Yogi, who came up with a transcendental meditation, and his disciple, Deepak Chopra. You know, he was also gaining some popularity in the 90s. I think what hap- what's happening with these ideas is that they become fashionable. And that's one of the beauties of capitalism. It has a tendency of commodifying almost everything under the sun, you know. Um, it turns into something very sacred into a money-making machine. And then it, for it to be sold, of course, you need to create hunger for it. You know. In some ways it's good, in some ways it's bad. I don't really know anymore. Stacy, anything? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I rambled on too much. Thank you. <laughs> Jackie? Yeah. Well, I apologize too as well. Cassie? Do you think that if 
for so removed from I guess Jesus' time and his context and the way people lived and maybe the simplicity um, is it even possible to live the things that he he talked about in our society I don't think it's necessary I think I think people should figure out where they are, what they have, what they want, and pick and choose the lessons, and only select those that are good for them and their life, and then modify the lesson so that it could fit the 21st century and the life that they have. You know, uh, there is no reason to live in a way that people lived some 2,000 years ago. I don't have the passion of Jesus. You know, I have never had these experiences. I don't know what he experienced, but that's not for me. You know, what I can do is I can read his stories and try to understand them the best I can. I, I don't think I even have the stamina to go somewhere, pray and plead with someone so I could be given, you know, aspects of the things that he experienced. I don't have that desire in me. Maybe I had it a long time ago, I don't know. But it certainly isn't inside me now. My desire is to kind of read the Gospels, for example, and not even read all the stories that he has. Only select those stories that I am able to comprehend, make sense for myself. And then take those stories into the classroom or in conversations I have with people. And change them so that they could fit my temperament the way I use language, the person I'm talking to, you know. You know, it's very, very tempting to desire to live, you know, a sort of lifestyle that we idealize in our heroes. You know, one of the nice things about like these superheroes, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, Catwoman, is that, you know, they're everyday ordinary people. Only when things get really, really tough and people need help, all of a sudden, the hero comes out. You know? And I think it's a good lesson for all of us, you know. Figure out what you're good at and then hide it, you know. And then when you realize that there is someone out there who wants and needs what you have, then wear your mask, you know. And Give them what you have. And then when the job is done, go back to being invisible. You know. 
and I don't think it's a bad way to live. Uh, you know, Jesus lived at a time where he would just go to the synagogue and say, you know, you've read in Isaiah that the Messiah is supposed to come. Well, I'm here to tell you, here it is. I am he. You know. Um, but he, he was also a person who could temper his ego, you know, from getting carried away. I don't think that's the case for someone like me. Um, if I get too much attention, I get drunk and I get intoxicated. And God knows what I will do to myself and people. I mean, you read the story of Irina Tweedy and Bai Sahib. I like to have such a life. Um, especially if you have a temperament that kind of fits those narratives. You go somewhere, it's, it feels holy and sacred, you know. You see a man or a woman and you shake and you tremble and you kind of forget what you were going to say and what you were going to ask. You're willing to sacrifice everything about yourself, your life, to this person. And he sits there, he sings for you. And once in a while you see tears rolling down his cheeks. You know. You go home in conflict, you go home intact, you're joyous, happy. I mean, these are great stories. I think if someone has the capacity for those things, that'll happen. There's a story that Kierkegaard tells, and I'm sure you've heard it. You know, he's walking and he looks through this window and he sees this man and this woman and all sorts of crazy things with, you know, each other's bodies. At first, he gets a lot of pleasure, you know, it's like, just watching porn, that's what he was doing. And then he, something kicks in and begins to reflect, really examine what these people are doing. And he gets really, really disgusted as to how human beings can devolve to such a stage where they do all these nasty things to themselves and to each other. I think if you were to think very reflectively about the things that we do on a daily basis, kind of like what Kierkegaard was doing, not much would survive. And I think the life of Jesus would be very ideal. You know? And in some ways it's really, really good because when Moses comes back, you know, he just fights for justice. You know, that's a meaningful life to live in some ways. I was listening to your guys' conversation in the book room where you were talking about kids throwing temper tantrums and 
what school they're going and what books they're reading and what toys they're playing with. It's a great conversation. It brings people together. You know, people get to talk about their children, their fears, their hopes. At the same time, it's such a ridiculous, absurd, you know, conversation. Yeah. These kids will get nowhere. We can love them. That's besides the point. You know, we are 10% functional, and we came from an arena where we had no cell phones. There was no internet. Our kids, they're fully consumed by technology. They won't even become quarter of who and what they are. They'll be really, really dysfunctional. And that's without adding the layers of Jesus and Confucius and those people and their ideas. <laughs> 